Well, prior to the sexual revolution that took place from the 60s through to the 80s, gender roles were fairly well defined. But as with most revolutions, what was was no longer. And here now to tell us what that delivered, we welcome back to our program Catherine Young, co author of Replacing Misandry A Revolutionary History of Men. Catherine's also Professor Emeritus in the Faculty of Religious Studies at McGill University. Hello, welcome back. Um, so last night we sort of left off in the just to the post war period, and I, I want to pick up sort of where we left off. Um, how would you characterize, we'll talk about the sexual revolution in a sec, but how would you sort of characterize attitudes towards sex prior to the 60s? Well, it depends on our period of time. We had the roaring 20s, probably lots of sexuality out there in that. Um, we had uh, men going away for, uh, for war and and whole generations of men lost, and that, you know, changed the relationship between men and women. And then, of course, everybody characterizes the 50s as the nice home with a white picket fence and the nuclear family, and, uh, and uh, the husband is boss, and the, and the wife is the stay-at-home mother with the children. But, of course, there are always lots of working women around, and they do not always get captured in mm. that. So, so it's image. a bit of a misrepresentation when we think of the 50s and that sort of that, that sort of traditional look that we have at it. Well, I sometimes think of my own mother, who was a, a wife uh, during that period. And, you know, to be a middle class uh, wife, many middle class women felt it was a, that it was a privilege not to have to work. Uh, and so she was extremely happy and content to be, to be such a wife until the next generation moved on and got their careers. And then, of course, she wasn't too sure that just being a wife had been the greatest mm. thing in the world. Well, uh, OK, so that's sort of the, the division of the sex, if I can put it that way. How are we looking at sort of the 40s and 50s? How are we looking at gender societally at that time? Well, during uh, the 40s was during the time of World War II. And the men, again, had gone off to war. Uh, they were drafted. There was a conscription, which only men were drafted. So when you look at all the argument, arguments around equality, one of the big differences, even to this day in, in the US, is that, that the draft exists only for men. Only men can be called up. So if equality is such an issue, why was that not addressed? OK, so we, ha we have that issue. But of course, when the, the men were away at war, the women were doing all the jobs on the home front and uh, no longer were in the homes and were gaining all those kinds of expertise uh, as they took over the jobs that the men had left behind. Then the war was over. The men come home and wanted those jobs. And that's where we start to get one of, the, one of the clashes, because women no longer wanted to go back into the home. And yet, because men had risked their lives on the battlefield, there had to be some kind of compensation and some kind of integration for those who had survived. All right. And then along comes this little pill. <laughs> Um, first in the U.S. and then in Canada, if we, if we stick to our, our country and, and the U.S. How big of an effect did the pill have on men and women and our views of societally of masculinity? Well, it was huge because, as we know, it decoupled uh, reprodu reproduction from pleasure. And that meant that women began to get but sexually more active because they felt safer about it. And I suppose men felt safer about uh, sex with women because they also didn't need to fear pregnancy in the same way. And how, what effect did that have on the male identity, do you think? Well, I don't know what the immediate effect was. Uh, um, I think by the time that we, we get beyond the pill to the sperm banks, I think that really begins to, to affect male identity. Um, because now we no longer 
need men as fathers, so to speak. One can go to a sperm bank and get sperm, and uh, one need not even mention men in that mm. context. Okay, we'll get we'll get We're to sort of get where we are. Um, but but the pill comes. I mean, many would say this. Almost everyone says, Catherine, this gave women the freedom to choose over their own bodies and how it was used. Um, it gave them more protection against having unsafe abortions and let them leave the house and go to work if they so choose. What do you say to that? Well, it was a good thing. I mean, I'm a working woman. I've been a career woman. So, you know, the contraception that, uh, that did give women the, the choice was something that broadened women's lives, for sure, and education and, and the rest of it. Uh, so women have no complaint on that front. And men? I think for men, as uh, it went back again over the whole century, but gradually the, the, the spheres of, for, for male uh, activity and identity were decreasing. So even at the end of the 19th century, women were moving you know, into the workplace, uh, women were taking on new professions, uh, and everything that women were doing, men could no longer claim that as a distinctive sphere. So I, thought, I think there was a, a feeling of an enormous shrinkage mm -hmm. going on. And sometimes there was was anger, probably, and sometimes fear as well. One of the areas, and we still today, um, when we talk about abortion, we talk about a women's, woman's right to choose. And as the pill came along, um, we, we, we started having this conversation. To what extent do you think that men have been excluded from that choice, from that discussion, from that decision? Well, they're now completely uh, excluded because you don't have to uh, 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 name a, a man. He doesn't appear on a birth certificate. You don't have to tell him if you're pregnant. We, we've really removed men completely from uh, any deep stake in this reproductive process. So women have gained it at their choice. And in the 80s, women were talking about reproductive power and uh, autonomy. So men should be out. There should be absolutely no say whatsoever. Our concern is what happens to any concept of fatherhood if there's no deep linkage into the reproductive process. So you're, so you're making the link between um, the fatherhood role and, and, the, and the defining of what masculinity is. Yes, well, if you look at masculine identity today, there's no longer a, an exclusive role of being provider, protector, or even progenitor. And these were the three big patterns. There were exceptions in different cultures, but these were the really three big patterns across, across history. Um, so as a woman, yes, I want to be a provider. Um, so I really don't want to think of recreating that as an exclusive uh, area f for men. Um, uh, protector, yes, I'm glad there are police, uh, you know, forces and there, there are due processes through uh, law and so forth, uh, so that it's not just individual protection, although I'm sometimes grateful that that's there. But I do recognize that we cannot take any context and ever, well, at least in the immediate future, talk about uh, how we appreciate men as providers, as protectors. We can't talk about them as firemen or as policemen. It, we have to be gender inclusive now. So if I argued in the beginning with the rise of um, civilizations and city cultures and how men had to compensate for the marginalization of the male body, by a cultural definition of exclusivity, now we get to our contemporary moment, and where is any definition of exclusivity? So we've reduced men, as we say, to a teaspoon of sperm, okay, or to being a, 
a helpful parent, a walking wallet. Um, but where do we say that there is something that is necessary for society, valued by society, and meaningful, that creates a male identity? Okay, let's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Catherine, let's get into a lot of what you just said. So um, let's talk about in vitro fertilization, IVF. Okay. Um, do you, are, you, are you making the argument that basically it's met, made men, obviously you still need sperm to make a baby. Right, but you know, if, if men are to be part of our future and our future goes through the reproductive process, uh, you can't say all of that is only sperm. You know, if, we go, if you visit a sperm bank, they, they, and there's descriptions of this in the book, they have taken the word man away from the sperm bank altogether. Um, you know, you have your little mail order business, and, and uh, there, there's just an attempt to remove the idea of men from sperm. This is product, it's called. Mm. Okay. I don't know. I've never been in an, in, a, in an IVF clinic, but I don't know that well, we treat just, eggs any different. Well, I don't know. Yeah, so I was, I'm talking about the, the, the sperm banks, and there are good descriptions on those on the Internet, and, mm. and we have some, uh, some, you know, in this book. What's wrong with that? Well, women now have every identity they want, and they always have a positive and healthy identity uh, at the minimum uh, through motherhood. And of course now with uh, any aspect of culture that they, that, that they want to enjoy. One of the things I noticed when we had the Canadian uh, Royal Commission on Reproductive Technologies was that Occasionally, the discussion of an artificial womb would come up, okay? Because that would kind of equalize male and female bodies as far as the reproductive process goes. But there was absolute fury that anybody should even think about the idea of an artificial womb. In other words, uh, women were going to protect their exclusive identity vis-a-vis -vis their reproductive capacity. For men, just sperm. I don't see a lot of men making the argument, though, that we don't like just being called sperm or what. Like, I, I don't see this sort of men's movement sort of making this, this argument. No, because it's hard for men to talk about this. I mean, if, if the, the ones who really are becoming aware of what's happening to men, they do notice the misandric stereotypes now. That was not noticed at all 20 years ago. Uh, they do notice the uh, double standards. They do notice things of, uh, of the inadequate evil imagery. And they do notice the sperm talk. How much they talk about it, but, but because the, you don't get too far beyond male stoicism very often. But what had happened uh, with women with consciousness raising in the 60s, 70s, and on, there's a lot of men going through that process right now. Okay, so make the link for me, not anecdotally, but historically, um, between that and, and, and being a good father. You raised the issue of fatherhood, that, that we have redefined it and it challenges our, our, our views of masculinity. Okay, so I mean, we, we all appreciate good fathers that we've had or, or hope that our husbands are good fathers uh, to, to children. Um, so the interaction with children and uh, the teaching and the learning and, uh, and the economic help and provision, all of that moves into our, our much better concept of hands-on fatherhood. But when you lo look at le uh, fatherhood legally, then many men would have to stop and think whether they would even want to move into that role of fatherhood. fatherhood. So let's just take the context of custody, for example. When custody uh, issues go to court, the woman generally gains custody. Um, why don't we have a law of the presumption of joint custody? 
and that there have been groups that have been trying to encourage that. Um, unless there is something where there is a demonstrated case of, of violence, uh, abuse, and therefore uh, there, an exception should be made. That law cannot get through. And yet we're supposed to be the big believers in equality. If we want men to really have a stake in fatherhood, and also, especially in the, uh, in the children, if there is divorce, and there's a lot of divorce, why wouldn't we want joint custody? Especially if we think of ourselves as egalitarians. Um, okay. Um, are you suggesting that the fatherhood has mm, lost its value? Yeah. Uh, because fatherhood usually needed special encouragement uh, by cultures. Uh, so there would be encouragement to marry, there would be encouragement of ways for the father to bond um, to his son through coming of age rituals. Uh, there's all kinds of cultural uh, props for, for fatherhood. Okay, it's not just biology, it's not just intercourse and a, and a child develops. It is a, a, a culture of, of, of fatherhood that is as important as the biological. And what happened to that culture? Well, it just, it, it's just, it's disappeared as all of these traditional roles of men have disappeared. Fatherhood has gone with it. So now Haven't we, we just now, redefined now, fatherhood, now though, Catherine. Haven't we just modernized our view of fatherhood as we have with motherhood? No, because women are still uh, are pregnant, give birth. Um, that's not modernizing motherhood by taking something away. Mothers have been modernized by giving them things in addition to their roles as mother. But fatherhood has been taken away as something valued. All right, I'm going to shift gears a bit. Okay. Um, we've talked about sort of the, the revolution, the evolution about the role of men in ma masculinity. So let's step away a bit from fatherhood, although may maybe that's um, not, well, let's keep it in. Okay, how would you characterize the state of masculinity today? I think it's in crisis mode. Meaning? You tell me what a healthy masculine identity is. Well, I don't know, Catherine. I mean, when I look at the evidence, men are still the top earners. They're still the, the top of the food chain. They still have better jobs. They're, they're, they're still the dominant gender in, in our culture. Well, so I don't, I'm not sure okay. what's in crisis. You're using the image of the alpha male. OK. OK, so there are, okay, good. there are a bunch of alpha males. And they don't need to worry about what other men are doing. And uh, women are quite keen to hook up with them because it, provides you know, uh, the relationships and the, the incomes and so forth. But most men are not alpha males. Uh, there's a downward economic mobility for a lot of men. I mean, we look at black, we could sometimes look at minority men and see this as the vanguard. So look at uh, black males in the US. Uh, there's enormous uh, downward mobility there. When I go into a university classroom, which I'm not teaching these days because I've retired, but for many years I'd go in and I would count the number of women and men in the class. And there would be a few men and a lot of women. And we know that women are now 60% of university classes. The 70% is not just in the humanities, it's in law, it's in medicine. Okay, there's a few pockets of things uh, in the sciences where the uh, statistics are not so high. But that means we're, getting, we're creating a growing underclass of men vis-a-vis -vis educa education compared to women. So if we've got an equi economic downward mobility for many men and a downward education, which will turn into a downward economic uh, mobility, then this is going but to But is there create. evidence of that or is that just anecdotal? Uh, I think there's evidence of it. Okay. Well, I'm not a statistician, so I'm not going to produce these stats out of, uh, out of my head f uh, for you, but I know the university statistics for sure. Mm. 
We can look at the, the dropout rate of boys in high school, and it's high. Um, so it, it's, um, and again, you look at, the, you look at uh, minority males, especially black males, vis-a-vis -vis how well black females are doing, and you can see that, uh, ec that economic mar marginalization. So is this a trend? The alpha males won't see it. Okay, and those successful upper middle class families and often middle class families won't see it. Life looks, looks just fine, but more vulnerable populations will see it. And what are they saying? Because I, I'm going to be really honest with you, I don't see it. So, yeah. so help well, me understand this from your perspective or from the perspective of the people that, you, that you've looked at. What would they say to me? Well, they would say... In what way? Well, it, it, that, that, that we're in a crisis of masculinity, and you can see it manifesting itself. Okay, uh, I would go, first of all, to the psychiatrists who deal with, uh, with male patients and ask them what they see. What do they see with the suicide rate? What do they see with the, you know, men in, 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 in drug cultures? What do they see with depression? So that's one profession that is out there and seeing the symptoms of what I think is this, uh, this deeper growing identity crisis. I often s ask men, uh, uh, you know, what is a, your distinctive identity? What makes you different from a woman? And often they can't answer. Okay, let's get back to the, the, the question, which is, I, we're in this crisis. What's to be done, Catherine? What's the solution as you see it? Well, the solution is really our next book. And um, we'll take another very, very careful look at fatherhood. And are there ways that we can do better by fatherhood so that men feel that they have a stake in fatherhood? Um, you know, we have to look at, at many different things. Can we do better by, by men on college campuses? Uh, of, encouraging enrollment, all the things that we had to do for women for 20 or 30 years. Maybe we have to now take another look at men and, uh, you know, maybe we need new kinds of courses that build the history of men into the curriculum uh, instead of just this one-liner that men have had all the, the power and they earn all the money and they at, their, at the top of the jobs and they're more of this and more of that. Uh, that's not encouraging to young boys or young, or young men because they know it's a struggle and mm. a lot of it's very discouraging. You know, what do you do if you have sons to give them positive images? How do you counteract the, uh, the negative images in society? So you have to get on top of the misandry, just as women have to constantly be on top of the misogyny. misogyny. Well, collectively, I would say we have to be on, perhaps be on top of all of it. Yes, but we, we do. I'll give you an interesting example. You know, just recently that uh, the episode at Dalhousie with the dent dentist students and the misogyny. Well, I was shown the, uh, the, um, mis the uh, student union's uh, uh, proposal for an equity course in the wake of that to try to create a better campus that would be free of discrimination uh, and harassment. So somebody then added a, an amendment and they wanted to say, well, be free of uh, misogyny and sexism and transphobia and this, that, and the other thing. Somebody else raises their hand and wants to add in one more item to that list, which was misandry. And they would not allow that to pass. Now, if you're really for equity, and if you're really uh, for inclusiveness, and you really want to be against discrimination and harassment, why not include that word misandry? Out. Okay, so I think that's a sign of our times that we're now in the midst of probably growing po uh, sexual polarization. And I think we, you know, for a long time there was misogyny and then we detected this problem of misandry. Now people are monitoring that. But I think we've got growing misogyny and growing misandry.
And that gives us the suggestion that perhaps the society is going to get more sexually polarized. Our fear is that if men don't really have a deep and vital stake with, as I've always said, positive images, then they could well become asocial. Hmm. It, if you're not valued, why bother? So that means that men who begin to feel like that turn to peer groups and become asocial. Um, doesn't help society, doesn't help women. We will have to leave it there, <laughs> Catherine. Thank you for coming in and talking to us. I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.